Greetings and welcome back to the fourth video of the muscle system, chapter nine. Last video, let me go back one slide. We talked about muscle fatigue and the things that cause muscle fatigue. We talked about some of the common causes of muscle fatigue, as well as cramping, which is a long involuntary muscle contraction. And what causes that or some things that cause that. So now we're talking about heat production. We're talking about heat production. Previously, we said that all cells generate heat as a process or a byproduct of metabolism. Basically, this means that all cells are alive. So because all cells are alive, all cells generate heat as a byproduct of being alive and producing whatever products it does. Muscle cells are your major sources of heat within the body. So the heat that our body produces mostly is produced by our muscle cells, even though all cells are producing heat as a byproduct of cellular respiration. So remember these muscle cells have a lot of um, mitochondria associated with each muscle fiber. And because they have so many more mitochondria than most other cells, they will produce more heat as byproducts of cellular respiration that occurs in these mitochondrial cells or organelles, mitochondria. Once that heat is produced, your blood transports that heat from the muscle throughout the body this distributes the most the um, heat throughout the body. This is also what helps to maintain your body temperature. So your muscle cells, skeletal muscle produces the heat. That heat is what supplies the rest of the body with heat. There are homeostatic mechanisms that promote heat loss when the temperature rises, when the internal temperature rises. So your skeletal muscles are more uh, close to your body's periphery or your body's superficial surfaces. Um, <clears throat> as your skeletal muscles produce heat, that heat is brought into the bloodstream and is brought throughout the entirety of the body to help supply heat to the rest of the body. As the temperature rises in your internal organs, your body um, needs to take some of that heat and release it by other means so that you don't overheat your internal organs. All right. So threshold stimulus. The threshold stimulus of a muscle is the minimal strength of a stimulus that is required to cause a contraction. In order for a muscle to contract, it has to get stimulus from your nerve cells. The nerve cells have to send a signal to the muscle cell in order for that muscle cell to contract. And there has to be a threshold. Basically what a threshold means is there has to be a point where that um, muscle fiber says, all right, now it's time for me to contract. Think about a little brother or a little sister. You have a little brother, you have a little sister, and they know you well enough to know how to push your buttons. They might come into your room, they might start tapping you on the shoulder, and you're at a point you can ignore it. You ignore all the words, you ignore all the taunting, but then there becomes this, there gets to one point, there gets to a point where you reach your threshold, where you will no longer be silent, and you are going to give them what they're asking for. You're going to give them a response. That is your threshold stimulus for your sibling. For the muscle, it's the same concept. There has to be a certain amount of stimulus given to the muscle fiber in order for the muscle fiber to contract. It's not going to contract with just any and every uh, stimulus. There has to be a threshold. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Once that threshold is, re is reached by that muscle fiber, an action potential is created 
And that action potential causes an impulse. So um, a, a, a like an electrical stimulation to spread throughout the muscle fiber. That in impulse that spreads throughout the entirety of the muscle fiber is what stimulates the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Those calcium ions then bind to the actin, which as we talked about earlier in earlier videos, once the calcium uh, binds to the actin, the actin shifts its orientation, it changes its position, so that now the binding sites for the myosin heads are available and visible and allows the myosin to bind to help to create the, um, the rest of the contraction. So, um, when scientists, doctors, um, lab techs want to know um, how muscles move or what causes a muscle contraction, they record the electric activity of that muscle contraction. So these are some of the, um, this is some of the information they get from recording the electrical activity of a muscle fiber. So a twitch. A twitch is a contractile response of a single muscle fiber to a single impulse. So <clears throat> basically, your muscle fiber gets an impulse and it contracts. One little bitty muscle fiber will contract to one little impulse. A latent period is the brief delay between the time of the stimulation and the beginning of the contraction. So when you first get the impulse, the muscle fiber doesn't immediately move. It doesn't immediately respond. It is a short, very, very short, and you can see on this um, graph that this is the stimulation and this is the latent period. So it's not long, but it is there. It is the delay between getting the stimulus and actually contracting because of the stimulation. You have the latent period, you have then the period of contraction. So the muscle fiber getting shorter. Then you have the period of relaxation, the muscle fiber getting longer. Then you have the refractory period. Basically the, um, the period where the muscle resets itself so that it can go through this process again. This is an all in none response. So, <coughs> excuse me, in order for your muscle fiber to produce a twitch, produce a contraction, um, it's either the entirety of the cell is going to produce a contraction or none of it. It's not like part of it is going to contract and then part of it is not. So let's talk summation. Summation is the process by which individual twitches combine. So we just talked about what a muscle twitch is. When they recorded muscle contractions, they figured out what um, the sequence of events, excuse me, pardon me. They figured out the sequence of events of a muscle contraction. So because of that, they were able to figure out um, how all muscles um, at large, the large muscles work together. And the way that a large muscle works together, your biceps, your triceps, your abdomen, your rectus abdominis. In order for these muscles to contract and to work together, there has to be this process of summation. So again, summation is the process by which individual twitches are combined. So each individual muscle cell is not moving individually, they are moving in concert with one another. And that comes, the, um, having all of those muscle fibers move together is a uh, summation. It produces a sustained contraction, which combine um, in a process called summation, right? So that is how the muscle in its entirety is able to contract.
Tetany is a higher frequency of stimulation of the muscle. The time spent in relaxation or between um between contractions becomes shorter and shorter, and that can lead to one long sustained contraction or one long sustained print. All right. So tetany is a process that we do not like. It is where you have more stimulation of the muscles. <clears throat> excuse me, so more contraction of the muscle and you have less and less time to relax in between each muscle contraction and that um, that leads to tectonic contraction. So each time you get a tetanus shot, it is a vaccine to help your body um, not get these tectonic um uh, contractions. So that is what that vaccine is about, trying to decrease the chances of you experiencing tetanus. If you'd like to um, get tetanus explained a little bit more, you can click on this video or um, copy and paste this link into your browser window to watch the video so that it can explain it a little bit more. Don't forget, you also have your textbook that will explain it to you. So let's talk about types of contractions. So we talked about how muscles work together. So um, in order for this to occur, you have that summation of the muscle fibers. But now we're going to talk about the different types of contractions that exist. So we have isotonic contractions and isometric contractions contractions. Let's talk about isometric contractions first. Isometric contractions are muscle contractions that the muscles um, start to contract. It gets a stimulus to contract, but the length of the muscle does not change. Typically, when we are contracting our muscles, the muscles shorten. Typically, the muscles shorten. Muscles change length in order for us to do movement. In isometric contractions, you still have muscle contraction, but the length of the muscle doesn't change. Imagine for a second that you are trying to lift a car. So you get under the hood of the car, you get a good grasp of it, and you start to pull, and you start to pull up, you start to pull up with all your might. You know your muscles are contracting because you're sweating, you're straining, your muscles are doing work, but they're not changing length because the force of the muscle, I'm sorry, the force of the car is greater than the force of your muscle. So you cannot overcome the weight of the car or put another way, you cannot generate enough energy to lift the car, even though your muscle is still contracting. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that is an isometric contraction where you are pushing against a force, but your muscle does not change length because the, mus the um, force that you're pushing against is greater than the force that your muscles create. Then you have isotonic contractions where your muscles contract and they do change length. Two types of isotonic contractions. You have eccentric and concentric contractions. Eccentric contractions are when your muscles lengthen. Concentric contractions are when your muscles shorten. So let's look at this image below of someone lifting a dumbbell. When the person picks it up and brings it closer to their body, this skeletal muscle starts to shorten. That is a concentric contraction. When this person takes that dumbbell and it, they want to put it back down, the muscle is still contracted because it's still holding it up. They're still moving against the weight, against the force of this weight, against the force of this dumbbell. But they're putting it down. So this muscle is starting to lengthen. That is eccentric contractions. So 
Isotonic is when your muscles contract and they change length. You have eccentric when you have lengthening contractions, concentric when you have shortening contractions, and then you have isometric where the muscle contracts but it is not changing length. This would be like you pulling on some bar that is attached to a wall that is not moving. That is isometric. <laughs> So now let's talk about the different types of muscles that are available in the body. We have three types of muscles. We remember this from the tissue section. You have skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle. Skeletal muscle is voluntary, meaning you can choose when and where to move it. Skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle, these are the muscles that are found in your hollow organs and in your heart. These are involuntary. You do not think about them moving. You do not think about your heart beating 60 to 100 times a minute. You don't think about your digestive system moving your food from place to place. These are involuntary muscles. The contractile mechanisms of smooth and cardiac muscles are similar to skeletal muscles, but are not exactly the same. Um, there are important structural and functional distinctions. So what we just learned about sarcomeres and the myofibrils and all of that, <clears throat> excuse me, that exact mechanism of action occurs in skeletal muscle only. There are similar processes in smooth and cardiac muscle, but they are not the exact same. When you look at smooth skeletal, and cardiac muscles, remember you have striations. The striations occur in your skeletal and cardiac muscles, but not in your smooth muscles. You have um, cells that are multinucleated, like your skeletal muscle cells. And they all look somewhat different. You should remember this from chapter five, the tissue section. If you do not, please make sure that you go over how each muscle cell looks. And these are just more images of the same thing to help you remember what muscle cells look like, what muscle fibers look like. All right, so now let's talk about smooth muscle fibers. Smooth muscle fibers are those that are found in your organs, your hollow organs especially. Um, compared to skeletal muscle fibers. So when we look at these in comparison to skeletal muscle fibers, we found that smooth muscle fibers are shorter. They only have a single nucleus. Remember, skeletal muscle fibers are multinucleated. These uh, smooth muscle fibers are elongated and have tapering ends. They're long and the ends taper, where skeletal muscle fibers were long and cylindrical and had rounded ends. All right, so these muscle fibers are shorter, only have one nucleus. They're elongated with tapered ends. The myofilaments are, are um, randomly organized. Because they're randomly organized, you don't have the striations. The actin and myosin filaments are not, <clears throat> excuse me, neatly arranged um, next to each other. So you don't get the same striping that you did for skeletal muscle. This is why smooth muscle has no striations. They do not have T-tubules and the sarcoplasmic reticula are not well developed. You notice that this says reticula instead of reticulum. This is the plural. Reticula is the plural for reticulum, all right? So these are some of the differences between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle. And yes, you should know this. There are different types of smooth muscle. You have your visceral smooth muscle. Remember, visceral means organ. So your organ, um, your smooth muscle uh, that is related to an organ, they are uh, single unit smooth muscles. Uh, you have sheets of muscle fibers. Well, you have single unit smooth muscle and then you have sheets of muscle fibers. 
These fibers are held together by gap junctions. Remember, gap junctions are like the tubes that are in between um, the membranes of the cells. So they hold adjacent cells together, but then those cells can share signals, share nutrients, share uh, whatever it needs to share. These visceral smooth muscles exhibit rhythmicity. Basically, they contract together in a rhythmic fashion. They exhibit peristalsis. Peristalsis is a type of rhythmic movement that these organs and these organ systems exhibit. And this visceral smooth muscle is found in the walls of most hollow organs. We have multi-unit smooth muscles. These fibers function separately um, like the muscles in the irises of the eye. So your iris is the color portion of your eye. This is where we talk about having brown, blue, um, hazel, green eyes. Those are the irises that give our eyes color. In those irises, each of those muscle fibers are moving individually. In the walls of the blood vessels, you also have multi-unit smooth muscle where the fibers function separately. So multi-unit smooth muscle found in the irises and in the walls of the blood vessels. Now, remember the third type of muscle cell is a cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is only found in the heart. These muscle fibers are joined together by intercalated discs. So where the two muscle cardiac muscle fibers um, come together, that cell junction creates those darker lines when we look at it under the microscope called intercalated discs. Please be sure that when you read these terms, you read it carefully and you do not get intervertebral discs mixed up with intercalated discs, two separate types of discs. In cardiac muscle fibers, these fibers branch. So the others did not branch. They were just the muscles themselves with no branching. There is a network of fibers that contract as a unit Cardiac muscle fibers contract as a unit. This is how your heart is able to contract as one organ, as opposed to having all your heart muscle cells contract individually. When they contract individually, that's a different problem and it has to be taken care of immediately. So cardiac muscle cells are self-exciting, meaning that once a muscle cell um, a muscle cell can contract itself, can send itself a stimulus to contract, um, and it has a rhythm to it. It beats at a certain uh, rate. It has a longer refractory period than skeletal muscle, so it takes a little bit longer for your uh, cardiac muscle cells to regenerate itself to get ready for the next contraction. Let's talk about skeletal muscle actions for a moment. So these terms you definitely need to understand in order to understand um, the actions of skeletal muscles. Each skeletal muscle has an origin and an insertion. Um, each muscle can be a prime mover or it can be a synergist it can also be an antagonist. Let's talk about each. So an origin is the immovable end of a muscle. The insertion is the movable end of a muscle. So the origin insertion talk about how the muscle is attached to the skeleton, how the muscle is attached to the skeleton. So this is the biceps brachii. This is the arm muscle. This muscle has three points of attachment. It has the attachment here, has attachment there and attachment there. When you contract your biceps muscle, you bring your forearm closer to your, um, your upper arm, that's going to shorten this muscle. Of the two ends, one end does not move, it is immovable, the other end moves. So this end of the biceps muscle is the origin. If you go ahead and flex your muscle, you notice that your shoulder does not move, 
when you are flexing your biceps muscle. So this is the origin. This is the insertion because this is the side that moves. The prime mover or agonist is um, the muscle that is primarily responsible for a particular movement. So if we are trying to um, flex our forearm, the prime mover of flexion of the forearm is the biceps brachii. Oh, excuse me. A synergist is a muscle that assists the prime mover. So in order to flex the forearm, I am going to use my biceps brachii. My brachioradialis muscle, which is a muscle that runs alongside of the biceps brachii, is going to help the biceps brachii to, uh, to flex my forearm. So biceps brachii is also going to flex. It's just not the main muscle that is producing that action. Then you have an antagonist. An antagonist is a muscle that, excuse me, <clears throat> that resists the prime mover's action and causes movement in the opposite direction. So if we talk about the antagonist to the biceps muscle, that is the triceps muscle on the opposite side of the arm. So the triceps muscle is the muscle that wants to extend your arm, whereas the biceps muscle is flexing your forearm. That, so the triceps muscle is the antagonist to the action of the biceps, which if we are extending the arm, then the tricep becomes the agonist, the biceps then becomes the antagonist. So any muscle can be an antagonist or an agonist at any point, depending on the movement. These are some extra videos that can help you understand origin and insertion and the concepts of agonist, antagonist, and synergist. And that is it for the skeletal, for the um, chapter nine, the muscular system.